This is 6 p.m. Japan time on Friday, April 17th. Hello, everyone. My name is Daisuke Tsuda. I'm a journalist. In cooperation with Gaze Institute, we are broadcasting hashtag Studio 202X Part 3 today. We are amidst of the coronavirus pandemic, and we are thinking about what uh, needs to be considered going forward. So we have been thinking about that together with experts regarding the pandemic as well as post-coronavirus world. Today we are having the part three session. The theme is lockdown globalization. On Twitter, please use hashtag studio 202x and please use this hashtag to post your comments and questions and in the latter half of the program we will be asking your questions to the guest speakers. Today we are joined by Dr. Marcus Gabriel philosopher and Dr. Seiko Mimaki and Dr. Takashi Shogimen from Otago University. So thank you very much for joining me today. First of all, I would like the three guest speakers to introduce themselves. Um, I would like um, the guests to spend about three minutes to talk about their activities. So first, Dr. Gabriel, if you could please start your self-introduction. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Marcus Gabriel. I'm a philosopher and uh, I'm currently writing uh, a book on uh, moral progress in dark times, universal values for the 21st century. And as I started writing the book, the pandemic hit human reality so, uh, you know, for me, the pandemic crisis right now is, uh, as it were, a social experiment for a new society. And I'm working on this topic uh, independently of the crisis, but then it hit. So now what I'm doing mostly is, you know, what a friend of mine has called post-coronial studies. So I'm studying the virus and I'm trying to anticipate the future. Thank you. So, Dr. Gabriel, if I may, for you, so you have been studying the philosophy, the philosophical thought. So, do you think that this event, the coronavirus pandemic, is an event that is changing our older views on philosophy? Um, Absolutely. Um, so I think that uh, the 21st century, right, was already on a path to a new society. There's the digital revolution, there's the crisis of liberal democracy, the rise of China, the rise of authoritarian governments everywhere on the planet, obviously Donald Trump, et cetera, et cetera. And all these phenomena together, right, they lead to a weakness in the global system of production. That is, world society is currently unstable. And the virus attacks not only human bodies, but it did attack the social order of the purely economic form of globalization. So the world order, as we knew it since 1990 in particular, the end of the so-called Cold War, that world order is now completely destroyed and it would be an illusion to think that we can return to how things were three weeks ago. That has come to an end. So we are in the midst of a revolution and the only way of getting out of this in a democratic fashion is by way of a new enlightenment. And uh, so what we need now is a global form of thought, a global cooperation of thinkers from various disciplines that can work out a new world order. 
nothing less will solve this crisis. Thank you for that. So the weakness of globalization is one of the topics, one of the main topics that we will discuss later on in the program. Now moving on from Takasaki City uh, University of Economics, Professor Mimaki, can you introduce yourself and your activities? Thank you very much. My name is Seiko Mimaki. I'm a professor at Takasaki uh, City University of Economics. And I have been work, um, working on the um, US diplomacy, and I'm currently writing a book. And it's very symptomatic of the President Wilson was focusing on democracy, not only in the US, but um, he believed that democracy was a universal concept. And he talked about the isolation as well as the collaboration uh, with other countries in the international community. And it has been 100 years since he wrote that book. And as Dr. Gabriel said, this is not an only an epidemiological crisis, it's a social crisis as well. So we have to have a sense of mission, not only in the United States, but also around the world. We have to have a sense of mission. The US is currently the, the ground of the largest uh, disaster or the largest impact of the coronavirus. And the US is now currently closing down their borders, but we have to work together with everyone, including Americans. So we are at a juncture. And so the world order, including the US that way, is something that I have been thinking about so far. Thank you very much. Next, from New Zealand, Professor Shogimen from Otago University is joining us uh, through Zoom, so I can introduce yourself, please. Hello, I'm Takashi Shogimen, and currently I'm on the southern part of New Zealand at uh, University of Otago. I am teaching the um, Middle Ages of um, Europe. European history and European history and uh, the political philosophy are my specialties. And William Opcom is a theologist and he thought that uh, he, he wrote many books on heresy. So I have been studying uh, ideas on authority, heresy um, in my activities. And that was the beginning of my uh, research. And as I have been thinking about European thoughts, I have also been interested in the thoughts and philosophy in Japan as well. And also the political philosophies in Japan have been my interest. Uh, Yanahara Takashi is one of the uh, people that I have studied in the UK and France and in U Europe and Japan. The patriotism history uh, of these regions has been studied in comparison. In Europe and in Japan, the patriotism, the term patriotism has been used since 1990s to talk about uh, political affairs. Patriotism and nationalism have different origins, but in Europe and in Japan, they tend to be used interchangeably. So patriotism, the idea behind that is something that I wanted to understand. So last year I wrote two books in Japanese and currently I'm writing a book in English. So I would like to explore the possibility of patriotism. So Professor Shokimen, I have a question. In New Zealand, the coronavirus outbreak I think that New Zealand has been successful in containing the virus. 
Can you talk about the current situation there as well as how the lockdown measures have been taken? Well, lockdown in New Zealand started three weeks ago. And before the lockdown, uh, the judgment was made very quickly. The first case, um, after it was uh, confirmed in 25 days after that, um, New Zealand went into lockdown. So compared to the European countries, where it took about 40 days, um, New Zealand was quite fast in moving toward lockdown, and I believe that worked very well. As far as I see in the news, um, new cases being confirmed is right now uh, declining. Today, there, was, there were only eight new cases being reported, and the number of deaths, actually, there were two reported today, and now we have double-digit numbers when it comes to death. Uh, but we see the effect of lockdown. And also, nobody objected to a lockdown inside New Zealand, and I believe that is because the government has provided support to the SMBs as well as the poor. And the approval rate of the current cabinet is about 90 percent. And so it's a very special uh, situation right now. Well, thank you very much. We would like to come back to this in the latter half of our discussion, but you talked about nationalism and patriotism which are actually two different things sometimes being confused. In Europe especially, we see the national borders being closed, uh, countries are closing down to outsiders. Is this patriotism or is this nationalism? What is your take on the situation? Well, I see this as nationalism and not patriotism. Patriotism if we look back in history, at least up to Sekiro, uh, I believe the thoughts will go back to that. And patriotism is about protecting the common good. And the common good is, especially in ancient Rome, is the citizens' freedom and happiness, those universal a political ideal and also to protect the political system in order to uh, realize that. That's what patriotism is all about. And after the French Revolution, um, it was affected by nationalism, and nationalism and patriotism sort of overlapped with each other. But right now, nationalism seems to have a stronger effect on things. But actually, Patriotism was supposed to be closer to cosmopolitanism, but it's now being pushed into the corners. Thank you very much. So uh, we have heard from all three speakers. Uh, we have heard about their background and their field of interest. So now I'd like to move on into our discussion. But um, before that, I would like to briefly look at um, the theme we hope to cover today. I have prepared some PowerPoint uh, pages, so I'd like to take about five minutes to explain. So if you can please look at the screen now. I'd like to first start with the words of Paolo Giordano. Uh, he's a novelist um, in Italy. Um, Italy also is under the coronavirus uh, crisis, uh, but he is as he has a background of being a physicist. Uh, he has a PhD in physics. So he's look at the situation from a scientist's point of view based on his scientific knowledge. And he's looking at uh, us now living in this world of corona. And this month, um, his new book uh, was published. And in the opening of his new book, um, he has written the following. 
He says that now that the coronavirus um, is spreading, this has become the most significant public health emergency of our time. But such crises like these are not the first one, it's not going to be the last one, and it's not going to be the most dreadful one either. Probably once it's over, compared to the past pandemics, we will see that the number of victims were not that high. However, this outbreak, uh, since three months from the outbreak, has already created a record. This new coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, was the first virus to spread globally over a very short period of time. So the Spanish flu uh, pest and um, there were many other viruses that spread globally, but this new coronavirus had spread over a very short period of time, but it spread on a global scale. And that's the importance, this, the significance of this coronavirus. And that was caused by globalism. Now we see people uh, more mobile and goods are also spread around the world, um, traded around the world, and probably that was behind this very quick global scale spread. And that's what I would like to talk about. But another thing um, that I remember very well in the past several weeks um, look, looking at the news is uh, Boris Johnson. Uh, words. Uh, he was also affected by the coronavirus, and he was in isolation at home. But on the third day of his isolation, uh, he posted this um, on Twitter. So I'd like you to hear We're this. We're going to do it. We are going to, to do it together. One thing I think coronavirus crisis has already proved is that there really is such a thing as society. So the important thing here is that there really is such a thing as society. And, well, we saw Brexit happen, and Boris Johnson saying this is um, quite unique. He had been trying to uh, destroy the NHS, but now he is saying that there is such a thing as society. Now, why is it that he said this? And I believe in the background of this is what Margaret Thatcher said. In a magazine interview, she, she said that there is no such thing as society. And this became somewhat like a title for her. And probably he was following Thatcher's thoughts until he had to be hospitalized because of the coronavirus. He started to think that, no, there is such a thing as society. So society versus nation, how do we think about that is one theme I'd like to cover today. So now we have about a little less than two hours to discuss, but I believe we can focus on four points in our discussions. One is this globalism and the consequences of globalism. We see this new coronavirus spreading globally. And then as a backlash to that, we now see countries trying to close up. They are locking down. So how do we assess this situation? Once we get some treatment, once we get uh, vaccines, and once we achieve this herd, immunity. Probably somewhere along the line, this corona crisis will end. But once it ends, will this lockdown situation be over? Will we go back to globalism once again? In the post-corona era, will we go back to globalism? So that's the first uh, discussion point. The second point is uh, probably something Dr. Gabriel um, has written in his essays, but in order to face this corona crisis, we need to have a global solidarity going across borders. 
And, of course, uh, it's not just going to end with this new coronavirus. The new coronavirus may change. We may have a second wave, third wave of the virus um, attacking us, but, or maybe some other uh, contagious disease may spread globally. But when that happens, of course, um, one nation state alone will not be able to uh, face this. Uh, we need to have this global solidarity. But is that really possible? And Prime Minister Johnson said that the many people are looking for society, but those who are looking for society, can they really have imagination towards solidarity? Or do they want to be controlled or managed? Will it lead to increase or further increase of the power of state nations? And another question. I would very much like to ask this question to Professor Shogi Men. The countries have the mono monopoly over the control of national borders and human movement. That is the reason why countries can take lockdown measures. So what will happen to the authority and power of the country in doing that? And that's the third question. And the next question is about technology and society and the relationship between the two. I think Professor Gabriel has been looking at this topic for uh, recent years. So in order to take measures on quarantine and surveillance, we know that technologies can be useful, but this may restrict our freedom and human rights. So the quarantine and surveillance technology may have conflict with human rights and, and uh, freedom, dilemma of freedom. So where can we strike a good balance? Now we have a strong global network of large corporations, uh, GAFA. So how can we position these mega uh, companies in this context? That is the last question that we'd like to address in the discussion. So I'd like um, first, to ask each of the guest speakers to talk about your take on uh, these issues. So Dr. Gabriel, uh, if you could spend about five minutes to share your uh, view on this issue, please. Yeah, okay. Um, let me begin with uh, the concepts of uh, nation uh, and society. And then I want to argue that um, we will not be able to go back to the neoliberal interpretation of uh, capitalism as a purely economic process. Uh, um, but, there, uh, but there is an opportunity right now, I will argue, uh, for a real cosmopolitics, which I have called co-immunism. Co-immunism is not communism, right? It's a new model for how we can cooperate on a global level. But first, let me try to like clarify some of the concepts here uh, um, that uh, you also addressed and Boris Johnson, surprisingly. So I think that uh, society, right, is um, the biggest unit of socioeconomic transactions. So Japanese society is everything that is done, right, within the purview of the Japanese rule of law. Um, so, right, I mean, if someone just buys some food or takes the subway or what we are doing right now, being on Zoom or running the country or being the emperor, these are all socioeconomic transactions involving many people. And so all of that, if you add them together, then you get society. So Boris Johnson is wrong in a certain sense. So when he says there is society and trying to reject Margaret Thatcher, right, then there is no such thing as society. What there is, is many social systems and sociology just studies, right, the totality of those systems, right, from different perspectives. But there is no single society. Boris Johnson is a nationalist. 
So when he speaks about society, he means something like his fantasy of England, right? So uh, uh, um, uh, I, it sounds like a helpful contribution because at least it's a rejection of Margaret Thatcher's neoliberalism, right? But the real reason for his declaration is problematic. So I object to what Boris Johnson said, right? Uh, the way in which he intends it, I think, is wrong. Uh, um, um, and uh, uh, if we have many societies, right, Japanese society, German society, if this is how we think, we're already making a mistake because the, the relevant units of socioeconomic transaction, such as social media or Zoom, right, or the production chains of ca the car manufacturing industry, these economic transactions are not national. Uh, so there, uh, uh, there is, let me be brutal, there just is no such thing as Japanese society or German society. These are illusions. This is just bad sociology. And, uh, and Boris Johnson is a terrible sociologist. Uh, that's one of his many faults, right? I'm not saying Angela Merkel is a better sociologist, right? I'm not making uh, that point, right? But it's just that, you know, we need social scientists, including, of course, economists and so forth, right? And philosophers to tell us how to draw those distinctions. So I would start there. And I think that the worst thing which has happened, right, in the last uh, three months, is not the spread of the virus. That's bad, right? I don't want to say, you know, like, uh, we shouldn't do anything we can in order to save those lives. But the really bad thing is the resurrection of nationalism. Now, right now, we're living in the complete nightmare of a suspension of democracy. Right now, no state is run like a democracy. Today, as I say this, we have no democracies. We have the formal procedures of democracy, no doubt. States of exception are legally validated in Germany, Japan, and so forth, right? That's true. But the, the current public sphere is not democratic anywhere. So I think that uh, China has become the role model of a reaction to the virus. And China is precisely not a democracy, but a dictatorship. So what we're doing right now in democratic society, so-called democratic societies is our reaction is a copy of a non-democratic uh, solution to the problem. Uh, so this is, what, uh, uh, this is where I see like a really very serious problem. And then to be even clearer why this is a problem, why would the virus be impressed by the German borders? Uh, so it's not a good medical or scientific idea to, uh, to think of this in terms of units, right? Why, for instance, a much better idea could be to take many Europeans to Siberia because there's more space, right? So why lock people into nation states? Yeah? So there are 80 million Germans now, more uh, 85 million people probably or more on the German territory and the virus is spreading among those people, right? And a lockdown reduces the probability of the virus spread. That's what we're doing. But why would it be a good idea to like bring those units together, right? Why not have different cuts? So no one has even studied that. Yeah? So the, the very reaction to think of this as a national problem is a bad reaction to a global problem. It's just a mistake to do it in this way. This is why we will just not come out of this situation uh, if we continue thinking nationally. There will never be an end to the coronavirus, never, not in two years, if we do it this way. Because here's a prediction, we just won't get a vaccine. We don't have a vaccine for HIV, we don't have one for SARS and MERS, uh, we don't have one for hepatitis, hepatitis C. It's not necessary that we even get a, a, a vaccine. And even if we have a vaccine, we cannot force people to get vaccinated, right? I'm not against vaccines, but I'm against the idea that we force every human being on earth to get a vaccine, right? And this might not even be a good solution. So in one word, if we don't find a global strategy, which is completely different from the one that we have right now, then we will never leave this situation. We will never go back to anything which looks normal. Thank you very much. So the society 
does not have national borders. I saw it was very clear and the lockdown measures are taken because we define our units as nation states. So it was very clear. Thank you very much. Well then, Dr. Mimaki, please. Can we first ask you to share your thoughts? Well, how to understand this corona situation? Um, we have heard a lot of things, but Wuhan, uh, during Wuhan's lockdown, uh, Fan Fan uh, actually wrote something, and I believe this will be translated into English, but um, this person wrote a diary, and I'd like to share some of them. One country, uh, being a civilized country or not, is it determined by cars running in the city or by skyscrapers or the country having a strong military or having a strong science and technology or a lot of arts or having a lot of great events? No. That country, being a civilized nation, will be determined by just one thing. And in the lockdown Wuhan, this person says that it's all about how the country treats the weak. That is the only criteria to see if a country is a civilized nation. And I believe that this is symbolic. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the United States, if you look at its diplomatic history, uh, even today, of course, it has the strongest military. Um, it has the strongest economy in the world. Um, it has very strong science and technology. Of course, there's a lot of things going on between China and the U.S., but the United States is the world's greatest power. However, they were really weak against this virus. And I think this is really a big thing. This could change the way international sociologists look at uh, the United States. Why was it that the United States was so weak against this pandemic? Um, New York or here in Tokyo, where we have a lot of people gathering, where the benefits of globalization was felt the most, those are the areas that are seeing the biggest spread and outbreak of the coronavirus, which means that our values, uh, how we cherish the global cities, uh, the market values that we've seen in these cities, uh, these are now being shaken. I believe we are now at this turning point of our values. Now, post-corona, what kind of country will truly become strong? What kind of country will truly be proud to say that they are a civilized nation? I believe we are now at a turning point of how we determine that. And in that sense, um, the past several decades, um, yes, we've talked a lot about globalization and there were a lot of people pointing out the negative aspects of globalization, but we've seen a lot of movements among people, money and goods, and it went a bit too far. A little before the coronavirus, uh, we talked about over-tourism, about m too many tourists, tourists coming uh, to a local area and the local traditions being destroyed. Their lifestyle of the people there have been destroyed because of the flooding tourism. And we have seen that happen. Already we have seen such things happening in the world. And probably going on, going forward, we will see what is the true resilience of a society or a country. And uh, Mr. Tuza uh, talked about Boris Johnson's words, and yes, I focus on that as well. But as you say, maybe people like him, because he has been hospitalized, he has been cared by NHS, and he now knows how significant that is. When he says society, when he says the British society, who makes up that society? Um, that came to my thought. When he came out of the hospital, uh, yes, he made a very wonderful, moving uh, speech. Uh, he called out the names of the medical uh, staff and thanked them and said that the NHS is the greatest thing uh, for the country and 
he said he was really grateful to the immigrants. He has in the past said that he's going to protect Britain from the immigrants, but now he's saying thank you to the immigrants who have supported him through this time of crisis. If he realized how important uh, the immigrants are, yes, this is going to have a big impact. However, when he says society, he does not include the immigrants. His words may not have been so significant. Well, Dr. Mimaki, Um, We have just heard Dr. Gabriel um, talk about society. But um, Boris Johnson, do do you think that his mindset has really changed? Or was that speech just one of his performances? Well, probably we have to see what he does after that. Well, after coming out of the hospital, yes, I believe that um, he experienced the virus himself. And now he understood uh, that the immigrants were really helpful in the NHS. And to prevent the coronavirus, um, Taiwan, we see that um, even in Taiwan, when, where they are rather succeeding in controlling the virus, uh, they do also think about the Taiwanese and non-Taiwanese. If a medical staff was infected because he or she was treating a patient, uh, and now there is this great focus on the immigrants into Taiwan, so, uh, but it, I'm sorry, immigrants into Britain. Well, then, who is it that is really supporting the British society? Um, probably, or I'm hoping that he now realizes um, the importance of immigrants because of his experience. Well, Dr. Mimaki has talked about who makes up the society of a country, who are the constituents of a society. Um, with this coronavirus, Um, outbreak. Uh, We are starting to see it from a different perspective. Uh, We now see in many countries trying to provide compensation for businesses that have closed or uh, probably paying money to everybody. So if you are a citizen, even if you are not the the country's um, citizen, um, you may or may not be able to receive it. In South Korea, if you are a foreign uh, person living in South Korea, you will not be able to get that money. And just yesterday here in Japan, the government suddenly decided that um, everybody will be eligible to be receiving 100,000 yen. Uh, We have heard that probably this will only be paid out to Japanese nationals. So how far do you provide that compensation. Um, And when you draw a line between uh, the nationals and non-nationals, that uh, will come back to that question of who do you see as a constituent of a society. Now I'd like to ask Dr. Shogiman. Well, how should it be is one issue, and what is the reality is another issue. I believe these are two separate issues. And how do we uh, understand the current reality? So global capitalism um, was the era we were living in. And the nation state um, has uh, gone through its role. And people have been talking about a borderless world. But now that we have this global outbreak, a pandemic, um, people have starting to think that uh, that thinking, the global thinking, was wrong. Uh, Since this pandemic, uh, we have seen uh, people starting to lower their voices in some aspects. And on the other side is uh, this thought that the nation is uh, trying to provide protection against their uh, citizens. But new liberalism and small government was the aim of the UK as well as the United States. And now 
they are dealing with this pandemic and suddenly they change their mindset. They are now intervening into social life uh, more aggressively in Europe. Um, the freedom of mobility, um, even among the EU nations, you see countries closing their border, national borders and the EU already. Um, Karl Polanyi uh, has started to talk about uh, the crustacean type uh, nations, uh, nations uh, covering themselves their, their self, their self into a shell, so to say. Uh, so now we see that happening among the European countries. So simply put, the contemporary nations are the authorities, so international and public organizations or global capitals cannot compete against nation states or governments. So nation states, currently we have many lockdown measures taken in various countries. So which one, sh which one should we take, the lockdown or globalization? John Topi is an American um, scholar and invention of passport. Uh, is a wonderful book by Toby. And one big characteristic of modern state nation is that the government monopolizes the control over human movement and national borders. So we have to think about what kind of negative impact we are seeing from this situation. and also the implication of that. And one of the implications that we can think about is that the country is clearly showing its own power in controlling the human movement and controlling the national borders. And these nation states are currently in crisis, but the movement of people and goods in terms of monitoring the movement of people and goods, they are showing their own character in controlling the movement. And the freedom of movement, depending on the country that you belong to, the passport is issued by the government, and as long as our movement is controlled by the government, we can use that passport. That's the norm. So the international freedom of movement is guaranteed by the surveillance and monitoring of the government. So it's quite paradoxical. And this is, situation has continued until today. And the contemporary passport was introduced at the time of the, world, the First World War. But before the First World War, the, not necessarily the governments had issued passport before World War I, but the passport that you have to carry when you uh, make international travel is something that was introduced at the time of World War I. We had a lot of international trade and a lot of exchanges between countries. And also Japan has started going into the global community back then. So the control of people's movement through the form of passport was introduced back then in the international community. So that's the history. The international freedom of mov movement is established and it's viable only under the surveillance of the government. So that's quite paradoxical. And we have to uh, discuss how we view this going forward. Thank you very much. Dr. Shogimen just pointed out a very important point. Globalization has advanced, and as a result, there are many global companies that have emerged. And these global companies 
in this coronavirus crisis, their presence is being lost. But the trust in the government and the reliance on the government has increased. And as a result, nationalism is rising. The national border system, we have overcome these borders and we uh, those companies and, for example, Facebook, uh, Google, the GAFA companies collected information beyond borders and using data they have become big companies, but maybe the way they run their business may have to be changed. So the control and authority of these state nations are now exposed, they are clearly shown, and this virus cannot be treated. And that's why the government is showing the power and people are accepting uh, the power of the government. And some people are actively embracing the power and authority of the government. That's the current situation. And as Professor Gabriel said at the beginning, in the future, we cannot go back to the situation that we were in three weeks ago. So we have to transform ourselves. And that is what we want to discuss. So listening to Dr. Shogimen's um, presentation or uh, remark, what did you think, Professor Gabriel? Uh, well, I'm gl glad to see that we all fundamentally agree with our perspective on what's happening. So I'm, I'm glad to see that we share like the tools of political historical analysis. And if we use those tools, like my colleagues uh, also did in their uh, presentation, then we see indeed that there is a whole different, you know, level of the problem right now, which is arguably more dangerous than the virus. Because imagine that, you know, this return to the nation state might lead to new forms of war. And already right now, you know, behind, as it were, the firewall of Corona, various uh, cyber attacks and other forms of war are happening, right? I mean, uh, governments are fighting for masks and uh, other goods for their health services. People are fighting for food and uh, the distribution of resources within Europe, clearly, within the United States, uh, but also between these big blocks. And obviously, similar things are happening in very complicated ways in Asia with the rise of China, etc. So everyone is like playing their tiny little power cards in the state of exception. And the citizens are not in a position to demonstrate against this because demonstrations are currently illegal. Uh, it's an incredible scandal, right? Uh, uh, yesterday, fortunately, a group in Germany uh, won in the Supreme Court and is now allowed to demonstrate in the city of Gießen, which is close to Frankfurt. And so they can now have a demonstration with masks and uh, speakers and social distancing. And of course, you know, why don't we even have demonstrations, right? So what's happening right now, I think, is that a lot of political decisions are taken. And these political decisions uh, are grave problems. Uh, so I only see really fundamentally on the political level, the rise of very dangerous and stupid forms of nationalism. Uh, every single nation state is doing it, every single one. You know, for instance, let me give you an example of stupid nationalism. The statistics, why does it matter, right? So everyone in Europe is proud that uh, the United States is doing worse than Germany, say, right? But that's a bad way of counting. If you count all Americans, right, and then the Europeans, then Europe is doing worse, clearly. And who mentions that Greece is doing very well, for instance, right? Uh, so be, uh, it's not of uh, it's an, of no one's interest, and just these statistics, they are complete fake, uh, because for one thing we don't know the real numbers, right? Uh, so let me give you the irony in Germany, right? Everything that the German government does right now depends on the development of the statistics. However, and the numbers are exponential, right? 
but also the, the production of test kits is exponential. So what we see is not an exponential rise of infected people. What we see is an, uh, is an uh, exponential growth in test kits. Uh, and that is a completely different number. And also, why would it have anything to do with Germany and not either Europe or all of the Eurasian continent, right? So just the, num the distribution of numbers and the Olympic Games of hygiene, right? So instead of the Olympic Games in Tokyo, we are getting the global Olympic hygienic games. Uh, and I think this is a completely ridiculous postmodern performance. Uh, it all looks like uh, the kinds of things that the famous sociologist Jean Baudrillard in the 1990s predicted. This is like a book from Jean Baudrillard. We are literally living in a computer simulation because what the governments are doing depends on computer simulations. We are in a simulation right now, right? And uh, while everything is completely real, right? There really is a virus. There really are nation states. There really is our health systems, right? The main decisions are taken by computers. And uh, this is completely paradoxical because the computers, right, have led to a cyber dictatorship which has been implemented by democratic governments. That's the, that's the political paradox that I see here. And I think that my colleagues agree with many of the things that I'm pointing out from different perspectives, right? So, uh, I think this is really more dangerous than the virus itself, and uh, we should point this out. So, Dr. Gabriel uh, comments, I, I'd like to first go to Dr. Shogiman, but uh, before that, I think I'd like to ask another question to Dr. Gabriel. So you said statistics um, is actually covering up the question. I, I thought that was very interesting. And that reminded me about Foucault, the philosophist, uh, who talked about biopower. Um, a Japanese philosopher, uh, Hiroki Asma, has talked about the coronavirus, and he also referred to biopower by Foucault. So, biopower, uh, using numbers, uh, controlling the mass using numbers and statistics. And it looks as if it's politically neutral, therefore it's very difficult for the citizens to stand up against it. That's why we need to be more wary. But with this corona virus, it seems that uh, we can't put a stop to what is happening. And that's what Azuma has pointed out. And I also feel that this is very dangerous. But against this, um, right now we are using cell phones or Google, Facebook, um, they are using technology and trying to move towards surveillance. And once again, uh, we see this biopower. We need to rethink biopower by Foucault. So, Dr. Gabriel, what do you think about this point? Well, indeed, um, like so many things in the last uh, 20 years, what we're seeing is the realization of postmodern philosophy. So what uh, Foucault or Derrida uh, uh, pointed out in their analyses, including of passports and those that don't have one and so forth, all these theories are now becoming reality. The paradox is this, Foucault used this in order to stop these processes, right? So he wanted to make the normative claim that we should not live in surveillance states. Yeah? But the surveillance states adopted right, the knowledge produced by these thinkers. Yeah? Um, uh, we know, for instance, this recently came out and was discussed, that the CIA did reports on the development of French philosophy in the 1960s and 70s. So this, this kind of thinking you know, from Foucault and uh, Baudrillard is well known to the media, you know, clearly to Facebook, Twitter, and so forth. They know how this works, right? They're very informed. 
And so what we see now is like a realization of Foucault's nightmare. Foucault could not even have predicted that. He thought that it, you know, this is too extreme to be real, right? So we live in a combination of a Foucault book and George Orwell's 1984, right? And uh, so forth. So all the dystopias, right? Post-apocalyptic society, you know, doctors controlling our behavior and so forth, right? So this nightmare is now reality. And uh, uh, I think that this is the reason why we need a philosophy that goes beyond postmodernism. That's what I have been doing in the last 10 years myself in order to replace those theories by something that helps us to overcome biopower. Right now, we just have brutal biopower and, uh, the, uh, and in Europe and the United States, religion has been replaced by statistics. So science is exactly in the position where religion used to be. Uh, that's why it's so crucial that uh, the Pope could not celebrate the mass. This was a political attack on the Pope, right? You cannot imagine the level of attack that uh, it's impossible in Europe to go to church, right? or to the synagogue and the temple and so forth, right? So I, uh, what I see here, here is really like, you know, a postmodern nightmare. Well, thank you very much. Foucault, yes, has talked about biopower uh, in order to put a stop to that. But now the power, people in power has been using that. And at the same time, this neoliberalism or the financial uh, people, financial liberalism people like uh, Facebook and others are, are now getting power like a government. And also science, or maybe medicine today, uh, people involved in public health, is overtaking uh, the position of religion. And I believe that is uh, confusing the situation even more. So. We've just heard by uh, Dr. Gabriel. Uh, I'd like to now go to yeah, Dr. Shogiman. Well, yes, it's exactly as you say. Surveillance. And yes, um, in the past, religion was there, but now science uh, and knowledge is uh, trying to take the position of religion. In modern state, the church, well, modern states, um, I'm thinking about the 17th century, 18th century countries. But they didn't have bureaucracy in the past. And so the church, um, religious people, uh, the religious leaders were there to control the citizens. Therefore, the church. Uh, was serving the nation's government. But of course, the church no longer plays that role. It seems now that the scientists have taken over that part. Uh, the medical people, uh, people uh, who are experts of contagious diseases, uh, they are at the front line and serving the state. So I think um, that was a very interesting point by Dr. Gabriel. And one thing about surveillance and control, globalization, that was about this great movement of people and goods. I believe that's the way people think about globalization, and that's why we had this world that is borderless. But what's important here is the surveillance by the governments being strengthened. For example, um, if you think about borders as a filter, globalization on one hand is increasing the number of people and goods going through that filter. But on the other hand, that filter, the border, since it is a filter, There are, of course, people who you don't want going through that filter. It means that you are putting people through a sieve of sorts. And since the, uh, the terrorist attack on New York and 
you see that uh, suddenly surveillance happened among people who looked sus suspicious. And here in New Zealand, um, in order to protect the environment and nature, we are seeing Um, we are trying to reconnect. Can you hear me, Dr. Gabriel, now? Okay, then we'll, we'll start. Well, yes, um, if you can go back a little bit and start your comment again. Well, yes, I was saying that um, if you think about national borders as a filter, globalization means that the number of people and goods that go through that filter increases greatly. And that's uh, the front side of globalization. But if you look at the back side, um, the other side of this, it, since it is a filter, it means that you are putting people and things to receive um, biohazard and terrorists would be caught by that filter. And this time, um, of course, the virus went through and uh, people who carry the virus uh, you want to capture with that filter. So there are two sides to globalization. The one side is um, you have this free movement of people and goods, but then on the other side, you have this surveillance and control by the government becoming more powerful. So you have these two things happening at the same time. And so this is rather ironical or paradoxical. Um, so now you have this close, uh, closed borders, um, lockdown. So I think this is a consequence of globalization. A very extreme consequence of globalization is the lockdown. It's a very interesting and a stimulating point. So the global globalization has two aspects to it. And the national borders function as filters. And if the government tries to um, do have the finer uh, filters, then their control will be even tighter. So what did you think, Dr. Mika, uh, Doctor? Well, I think that we are going in the same direction, so I am very happy. But the current situation that we are looking at is quite severe. So we look at the current situation the same way as a group today. And as Dr. Gabriel said, the uh, China, which is quite authoritarian, the country does not have to think much about the rights of people, and as a result, China was successful in containing the virus. This fight against the virus is not just a fight against the virus, but in the democrat democratic countries, the democratic nations, how can we protect the democracy? This is also a fight in that sense as well. And Dr. Shogiman, now lives in New Zealand, so in New Zealand and in Taiwan, they have been fighting against the virus, but at the same time, they are not sacrificing the value of democracy. They are utilizing the strength of democracy in responding to this virus. That is how I feel. Um, regarding New Zealand, I would very much like to ask Dr. Shogimen uh, more about that, but the um, health minister is giving the briefing every day in Taiwan, and uh, the minister is always sharing the information with the citizens. So if the, doc the government tries to do everything, then that is quite costly, and we are curr currently in the unprecedented times, so if the government tries to do everything, then that will be a big risk. That's how I felt by looking at China. So we need to take drastic measures swiftly, and authoritarian countries tend to have a strength in that sense. But information needs to be shared with citizens widely, and scientific evidence also needs to be utilized. 
And that kind of information needs to be shared to the citizens, and the citizens have to be convinced as the government takes measures. I think that is the right approach. And New Zealand and Taiwan, I believe, are giving us a beacon of hope. Yes, I think you are right in pointing that out. Democratic nations and control, strong control and authority. Those countries are, obviously, are those non-democratic countries can do that. And the stronger the control, the better the disease control will be. But currently, we are in the nation states and democracy. So we have to think about how we can do this effectively in these countries. And New Zealand and Taiwan have been doing a great job in terms of disease control as well as disease uh, communication. So even if the countries have valued these things, I think that the healthcare system itself uh, is also one factor that we have to think about. If the healthcare system um, is strong enough, then it can respond to the virus, but if the healthcare system is not strong enough, then the system collapses all of a sudden. So as long as the infection is still within the capacity of the healthcare system, then things go well. But once it goes beyond the threshold, then the democracy will be threatened. So that is one other thing that we'd like to discuss uh, today. But uh, for now, we would like to have a break, and 10, minute, uh, ten minutes after the... Uh, I need to go, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, I need to go to another meeting. <laughs> um. So we, we will continue the discussion for now, and then we will wrap up. So uh, can you um, give us a closing uh, remark on, uh, from your side before you go? Um, yes, of course, if you want to. So first of all, let me thank you again for the invitation and for these uh, very helpful perspectives from my Japanese uh, colleagues in Osaka and New Zealand. That was very, uh, very helpful. I'm glad to hear this perspective. Um, so I, you know, I would like to emphasize that we need precisely to do more of this in the future, right? So uh, interdisciplinary global conversations about how to move uh, forward to a new kind of organization. And um, I think that, uh, you know, the health system argument, so I want to conclude with that, which is a very important argument uh, from the side of the government for biopower. Uh, this argument is flawed. So take Italy. Right. So the northern Italian system was overloaded. Sure. Right. But why did we not distribute those people through Europe? So the European system would not have been overloaded at all. Right. So even if we continued, no one even thought about that. So we were just shocked by the Italian situation and closed the borders. This was a completely immoral choice, which is why Ursula von der Leyen yesterday apologized to Italy, which was a really impressive maneuver. She apologized to Italy. Yeah? So the European Union failed Italy. And so there was a completely different solution. So the argument that all our health systems will be overloaded by the virus, right? And therefore we can pause democracy is not a valid argument. It's a fake argument. It only looks very plausible, right? But if we had a global solution, right, distributed the health systems, then probably we could le let the pandemic run, right? Maybe a global lockdown for a month could solve the situation, probably could, right? Lockdown, flatten the curve, prepare the global health systems, distribute the sick, right, over borders, and then we could go on, right, with democracy and develop a new world order uh, after neoliberal globalization. Perfectly possible. But no one is thinking about this because the argument is always that national health systems will be overloaded. 
Well, but that is a side effect of the national decision to treat this as a national problem, right? So uh, the, the argument, you see, the argument is circular. It presupposes what it's supposed to demonstrate, meaning it's a bad argument. I just wanted to point this out in conclusion, right? There is a democratic alternative to what we are doing right now, right? What we're doing right now is not good democracy. It is democracy, but it's not good democracy. And we can find a good democratic solution, but it has to be global. And that means that we need to give up the idea that these are national problems. These are not national problems. If we treat them as national problems, then we will create new problems. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude. So, Professor Gabriel, may I ask you one small question? Okay, sure. <laughs> So science is overtaking the religion. So the experts and medical personnel are giving us advice. How seriously should we take their advice? Of course, we should ter seriously take their uh, advices. But medical professionals tend to focus on the health system. But of course, we have to continue our livelihood um, and we also have to think about valuing our freedom. So sometimes we might have to ignore the advice coming from healthcare professionals. So to live as a human being, how should we yeah. take the advice from medical professionals? Yeah, so if you ask your dentist, if you ever should eat chocolate, the dentist will say no. If you ask a hepatologist, a specialist for the liver, if you can drink sake, he will tell you no. So if you ask your doctor, all the doctors, how you should live, you couldn't live. <laughs> you see, we don't take health specialists seriously. We take their advice when it matters. If we live the life that natural science recommends to us, so if our goal is just to be healthy, then we should kill ourselves because this would be a bad life, right? Being, so the best way of being healthy is stay at home and eat broccoli, right? But that's not a good life. This is a bad life. So we need to see that, right, uh, uh, um, you know, if we have a dictatorship of medical doctors, right, then I would rather live in North Korea. Uh, the, um, so generally, the rule cannot be that we should always follow the advice of the medical specialist. That's not a good rule, right? Now, in this scenario, of course, we need to know how to deal with this by asking doctors. No doubt, doctors know stuff about viruses, so we need to consult doctors and healthcare specialists. But doctors do not know that nation states are evil, right? But we know this. So they should not just ask the doctor, they should ask the humanities and social science professors who specialize in the question how democracy can work. A doctor doesn't know anything about democracy, right? Doctors committed atrocities in the Second World War, right? And so did scientists. We wouldn't have the atom bomb, right, without the scientists, right? So scientists are not as such ethical experts. They can be good or evil. But what we need to do and what we need to avoid is the specialty of, of you know, the humanities and social sciences. So if people don't consult people like us, they are making a terrible mistake. That's what I. That's why in one of my interviews, I called the current situation in Germany, right, a kind of scientific North Korea, right? I just don't want to be in North Korea. Well, thank you. Um, I believe that's why, Dr. Gabriel, you said uh, we need this interdisciplinary, international or global discussions like this so that we can talk about the ideal world we would like to live in. Yes. So, yes, I understand that. Thank you. And thank you very much for staying with us um, despite your very busy schedule. Thank you. Yeah, hope to see you soon again. Bye. Thank you. Well, then let's take a five minute break and um, we will restart uh, from around 20 past seven or so. Thank you.
So case, this is a program done in cooperation with Geta Institute. Um, this is studio, hashtag 202X. And we have been looking at the coronavirus situation, um, lockdown and globalization. Um, in the first half, we had Dr. Marcus Gabriel uh, attending. However, now he had to go uh, for another engagement. So we are now left together with Dr. Seiko Mimaki and Dr. Takashi Shogimen. Uh, so the last part that we've heard about um, how far should we listen to advice from medical specialists. I think in this is involving all countries, and we have various global sectors, various social sectors um, involved. So it's not something that could be solved with just the power of nations. Uh, there is only a certain extent that policies can uh, do. That's why we need to cooperate more. I believe that was also uh, what um, Dr. Gabriel wanted to say. And now, Dr. Mimaki, what, how did you take um, that last uh, comment? Well, yes, if we just follow the advice of doctors, it's not going to be interesting. But on the other hand, a, a medical perspective for society in order to prevent the virus from spreading up uh, Yes, we have the doctors uh, to help us do that, and that is good. And maybe we should have economists and moralists and bring in interdisciplinary perspectives and ask the politicians to make the final decision. So a pure, from a pure uh, perspective of preventing of the virus from spreading, uh, we need the doctor's perspective. but. Uh, using their expertise and having people provide advice. Uh, maybe um, in the world that would be WHO's rule. But WHO's reaction against the coronavirus and also we see the politics related to WHO. Uh, of course, WHO is operated by money provided by governments. So is it really a neutral uh, advice from experts. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to see if it is so. Uh, people have been criticizing the WHO that they have been leaning towards China. And now the United States is saying that they are not going to pay money uh, to WHO anymore. So. Now, WHO itself now started to criticize Taiwan. And as Dr. Gabriel said, people who are doctors, uh, we want doctors in the political scene as well. But And of course, the doctors are living inside the same society. So yes, their perspective should be reflected in politics and policies. But do we have a, an international organization that is really neutral and capable of providing that perspective? It seems really difficult. So an international or global solidarity, I believe that's what Dr. Gabriel uh, was talking about. But yes, um, it's not just the WHO, but we have a lot of international organizations out there. and. They have been playing their role, but now that we have this big pandemic happening and now you see countries fighting over each other, and so we've seen the limits of these international organizations. The coronavirus has shown us uh, the changing roles of these experts. I am a journalist, but I see that this coronavirus situation is very difficult. When you compare it to a, national, a natural disaster, um, for example, uh, people who live close to the, uh, 
the nuclear power plants, they were fearing the next tsunami from hitting because it will uh, risk their lives. But uh, so that we kn knew how to act. But it's very difficult to, to understand what we can do against the coronavirus. We can hold ourselves up in offices, but if we go out there uh, to try to make a report, uh, we may get affected, and then we might be spreading the virus without knowing. So we have to change the way we work as journalists, and I think that's going to change our values in a, in a way. And in international politics also, I think this is something that needs discussing about these rules. Uh, do you see them changing? Uh, well, I have been focusing on the past 100 years or so in my research, but the sovereign states uh, making up the international order what is cooperation under that system? So you have to care for the others, and then, and if you think about Europe, yes, Europe should have helped Italy. However, uh, if you help others, and then it will come back to your country. But right now, in reality, we see that uh, we are fighting over masks for, to protect our people, or we are trying to hoard up goods, and if that continues, the international order will collapse and that will actually damage yourself. But you can't really invest in others. Uh, you cannot really be helpful to others. Why is it that we have these wars? If we eliminate all borders, we may eliminate all wars. We had this idea uh, for the past 100 years and uh, the perpetual peace under Kant. Uh, well, so international nations, uh, but if, if we can really establish that, if we establish this big, huge state that will suppress other countries, uh, that probably that's the only international government that we can create. Maybe having a sovereign nation system and having them cooperate with will be the best way, probably like under the United Nations. That was the idea of Kant. So we tend to think that if WHO had more power, but because they are imperfect, um, in, international organizations are actually reflecting the reality of these nation states. And so then working in solidarity, um, that will be more beneficial. How can we make people realize that? Um, probably that will be the key. So now I'd like to ask Dr. Shukimen. Dr. Mimaki said Kant earlier. So we have to learn from the history because I think that importance of works of historians is now being highlighted. The Pest by Camillo is now a bestseller, and at the time of the Spanish flu, what did we learn at the time? The things that happened at the time of the Spanish flu pandemic may be happening now with coronavirus, so we have to learn from the history. So the those people who had these uh, thoughts are uh, the people we should learn from. And I think that the way we work is currently changing based on the lessons learned by, from them. So in parallel with history, I am actually being quite pessimistic. The issues that we are facing are that the virus is invisible and what we have to think about is how to tackle this invisible enemy. The modern states responding to an invisible enemy. This is not the first time we are doing this. At the beginning of the modern state era, Back in 16th and 17th century, the modern states started developing themselves. And just like 
this pandemic, they were fighting against evil. And as a result, they developed the nations as absolute nations, the witches who had contracts with evil. They were harming the agricultural produce, and with the magical power, they were trying to assassinate the king. People believed that. And as a result, from the leaders of the countries to general public, people were fearing witches who had magical power and who had the power of the evils. So the authority of the god was claimed by the witches because evil can only be beaten by the god. So in the 16th and 17th centuries, the fight against witches and witch hunt was at the, the height. And modern states developed through the course of that fight. And by fighting against invisible enemies, the state gained power. And in contrast to that, if we look at the current situation, I believe that it is quite natural that the state powers may increase as a result of this crisis. At the end of March, well, I am contributing article to Asahi a newspaper, and the tweet by Dr. Shogiman was mentioned in one of my articles. Currently, the presence of global companies is uh, being lost, and the government's presence is increasing. And I was very convinced by that argument, so I referred to that in my article. So after I referred to your tweet, well, the government's power is now getting attention, but it's not just nationalism. The functions and roles of the government should be reviewed once again at this time. I think that German people started discussing that. Uh, this program is run in cooperation with the Goethe Institute, and some staff um, mentioned that. So I want to talk about that in today's discussion as well. So not to compare with the history, by looking at the current situation, Dr. Gabriel said that if Italy's health system is under strain, then the EU as a whole should have helped. It might sound quite idealistic, but actually in Germany, I think that Germany is trying to uh, receive some patients beyond borders, so the solidarity beyond border. If we are to go in that direction, the governments are the ones who can make the decision. So there may be positive opportunities. I don't think that everything uh, should be considered pessimistically. What do you think about that? So the civil state or civil society, as Dr. Gabriel said earlier, the society does not have borders. But I do not necessarily think that way. In the nation state, civil society exists. So I had a bit of a disagreement in that sense, but the civil society, if we hadn't had any borders and if we, had, if we were cosmopolitan, well, Without that assumption, if we assume that we are in the um, states with borders, then the next question is, how can we cooperate beyond borders? And what I think is interesting is in the case of New Zealand, the lockdown and closed national border, the general public didn't really oppose to that. It went very smoothly and it was successful. However, looking at the U.S., it didn't go well. Why was that? 
I have been thinking about that, and one possible reason I can think of is that they are both civil societies, but in the end, the politicians who make the final decision. In the case of the U.S., the ultimate value and political value is freedom. Freedom is valued the most, and the freedom of movement is currently being restricted very strictly, and they were really um, hesitant to do that. However, in the case of New Zealand, rather than valuing freedom, the characteristic of New Zealand politics is fairness. So the political discourse in New Zealand, yes, New Zealand is also a democratic state, but rather than freedom being equal, being fair, is important. So no one should be left behind. The socially vulnerable people need to be rescued as well. From that perspective, the certain restriction of freedom is something that we have to accept with conditions. And every day at 1 p.m., Prime Minister gives a briefing based on the fact and the New Zealand politics and policies. The opposition party has launched a special a panel and the special panel toward the government asks very difficult questions and also criticizes the government. And it's done in an open manner. So even though we are in lockdown, the democratic process is intact. So in that sense, in the end, what political values should be valued in liberal nations of people's lives come first? Since Thomas Hobbes, that is the ultimate requirement. So what is the ultimate value that we uphold as a civil society? If we have the common value as civil societies, then I believe that cross-border collaboration is possible. So yes, as Dr. Mimaki said, the Chinese author's uh, diary, the response or how to treat the vulnerable people, that is also relevant in this context. And also it's about risk communication as well. The Prime Minister is giving briefing every day and the opposition party has the special panel and the opposition party is also talking about uh, some gaps that are happening. So from the political perspective in Japan, it sounds like a, a science fiction or some fairy tale, but it's happening. Well, liberty and fairness, um, I think that's the difference between the two countries. But um, Bert, Bernie Sanders in the United States, um, of course, he withdrew from the presidential race. But under this situation, uh, His thoughts is not a radical thought by just one person. I believe his message is spreading through many people. He said health care should be a right of all people. Uh, well, yes, he is no longer in the presidential race, but uh, I believe his message really rang through the population. So fairness versus liberty. Um, and yes, uh, that's the appeal of the U.S. society, but even there... Well, of course, um, he is a politician. Maybe what he's saying will not all be realized, but already Biden um, has also included some of Sanders' points into his uh, appeal. And also President Trump is also looking at this coronavirus. Uh, you can't overlook this situation from the perspective of politicians, um, and the, the writing by Fan Fan in Wuhan. Uh, what 
is the role of a government or nation. Uh, I believe we are seeing that changing, even in big countries like the United States now. National power, uh, what we want from the nation is getting bigger. Maybe the role of the government is getting bigger. Um, I believe that is what the coronavirus is also bringing. But as the power gets bigger, yes, there is a negative aspect to that. So we need to keep that in mind. While we also try to protect our lives, we also want to protect the fairness of society as well as freedom in society. So then what can we do? The New Zealand political situation uh, versus the U.S. political situation, is it freedom that you uphold as the ultimate uh, value or is it fairness? Uh, the U.S. society as well as the New Zealand society, the biggest change is probably the confidence that people have in the government. Um, right now, the approval rating of the Trump administration is 40 percent. Um, right now, in New Zealand, you said it's 90 percent. I mean, even in Germany, you see the same. Among the European countries, uh, there is probably more confidence towards Angela Merkel uh, because she's transparent and she's a good political communicator. And probably that's why we see her polit policies working. So the government's power may get stronger. But if that is not approved, uh, the government may not really function very well. So, Dr. Shogiman, what's your opinion? Well, yes, I, I, it's exactly as you say. And I think I've tweeted about this once, but in the case of New Zealand, uh, the citizens' trust towards the government is very strong. So that's why uh, the approval rating right now is close to 90 percent. On the other hand, what's important is the government, the state also, has to trust the citizens, and they have to communicate that trust. The, so, uh, the civil society is trusted by the government. Um, Prime Minister Ardern, uh, every day at 1 p.m. in the afternoon, she holds a news conference. And she speaks to the citizens. And she says that she trusts the citizens that they will do what they have to. So trust is a very important component here. And as I said, um, freedom, if I can say one thing about freedom. And this may be somewhat uh, political thinking, but uh, the freedom of movement being s it is actually uh, upheld because of the surveillance by the government and control by the government. So then what does freedom really mean? We have to think about this. So freedom in terms of freedom of, of movement is that you are not being intervened or being controlled physically. It's just that. So as long as you see freedom in that way, you are not being forced from going over a border. Even if you are being monitored, uh, you will be deemed as having freedom of movement. Now, being under surveillance, uh, it is fearsome because uh, you don't really know what the people who are making that surveillance will do to you. But even if you are monitored, if you're not doing anything bad, you might think that there is no problem there. Uh, the government will always say that. But what is bad? Who is going to determine what is bad? And more than that, if you are being controlled, if that is a fact, 
well, then what are the consequences of being controlled? Uh, the ones who are being controlled won't understand that. So, if we are being watched and we are being controlled, those who are controlling and monitoring, uh, you have to start um, watching what the, those in power are doing. So, freedom of movement as not being bound is very weak. Freedom of movement has to be a different kind of, of freedom, a more positive freedom, because there are different kinds of thinking uh, uh, from a... We need to once again really think about what we mean by freedom of movement and then think about the power and rule of the government. I think that's very interesting. So the technology of surveillance, and fairness, and uh, also confidence uh, may be determined by that. And if the governments are going to increase their power because of public health, concerns, um, maybe there will be people who want the government to have more power. Well, if it is a democratic uh, country, and if we don't want, like what the government is doing, we can always uh, change it through our voting. But the surveillance technology is getting better. Um, now, through the internet, we are being connected globally. And the surveillance technology, the central part of that, um, Google, Facebook actually has it. But Google and Facebook, um, we can't change them through our voting. So you have these double surveillance, the global information companies and the governments. And these two entities are somewhat connected. Sometimes they are moving under different thinkings, and that's making a the situation more chaotic. So, so what do you think will happen to this? I believe that is a very difficult issue. Uh, a surveillance government, and you have the surveillance capitalism, which is a new idea. Zuboff uh, from Harvard Business School uh, talks about this era of capitalism and surveillance. I think uh, that uh, paper came out last year, and it's a bestseller now. And what is said in the paper is uh, GAFA, uh, Google, Facebook, and others monitoring people's actions and the data that is collected through that, the user profile information. And that is being used to forecast how people behave and that is led to benefit, benefits for governments. And we now see capitalism taking that form, which means that we are watching people, and that is turned into data, and so people are being used as tools. So the companies are controlling or manipulating people the way they want. So that is the biggest threat of or the danger of the capitalism. And Dr. Gabriel talked about that this earlier. So how can we tackle this? We are in democracy, so we cannot do much about it. So democratic nations have to be stronger. And how can we do that? As you mentioned, the states are not always the friends of people. The surveillance state or surveillance may um, work hand in hand with the large companies and digital authoritarianism 
may rise as a result. So I think that we are in a very dangerous situation. So Dr. Gabriel said that uh, the EU should have solved the healthcare system problem in Italy. And when I heard that, what I thought is that in Japan, Japan um, has the ocean all around the nation, so it might be difficult. Well, today's theme is the lockdown globalization. And when I I uh, had the first briefing with Gate Institute. We thought that one of the key points is uh, we are an insular country. Japan is an insular country, and New Zealand is also an insular country. And I think that there are both pros and cons of being such an island nation. What do you think about that? Yes, you are right. New Zealand is also an island nation. So the lockdown measures or uh, the closed border measure worked very well, but in the case of Japan, uh, it's not working very well, so it's very difficult to understand why that is. What do you think? Yes, in relation to what Dr. said earlier, in this coronavirus crisis, the leadership is gaining a lot of attention. And one thing that left a uh, big impression on me is on March 18th, Chancellor Merkel gave a news conference and she talked about a very difficult situation that we are in now. And she said that the, she talked about those people who were working at the front line, those who were uh, putting items on the shelves in the stores. We have been talking about a big topic, globalization. However, if you look at the economy, we need a lot of manual labor. A lot of things have to be done by people. Maybe in the future we might be using more robots, but now, today, a lot of things have to be done manually by people. So those manual operations, who are they doing that? At the time of this crisis, the political leaders have to be aware of that, whether or not they can be aware of that. Well, the doctor talked about the confidence, confidence of the people in the government and the confidence of the government in the people. It has to be reciprocal. So in every corner of the state, people are working and the government has to be aware of that. And in that sense, the confidence is very important. Yes, that is a very important point. The political leaders' words are really getting attention today, more than ever. And in Japan, we are in a precarious situation because those leadership um, people are not giving the voices. The bureaucrats are bright. So even if the political leaders are not excellent, the things move on, uh, go ahead. In Japan, people said that. However, the bureaucratic system, the bureaucracy, should not be the only system that makes things happen. But rather, we need people who are more accountable and responsible for taking action. I think that this is becoming more important than ever. It's be being revealed because of the coronavirus crisis. I think that this should be an opportunity for political leaders to change. Yes, the leadership's words. Things were working well in the past, but those things that were making things happen are the, the things that are not making things happen today. Uh, one expert talked about bullshit job. Uh, the title of the book is Bullshit Job. And he said that uh, there are excellent care workers in the society and there are critical workers. And their wages are very low, even though they are critical in having our livelihood. So in these essential areas in the society, they are having very low wages. However, the society works thanks to their manual labor. So he called the 
occupation, a lucrative occupation, a bullshit job. The low wages of these essential workers are mentioned by political leaders, and because they are talking about that, we are understanding this contradiction. And we are in a tough situation, but I think that the values of of people can be changed, and that might be one thing that uh, is good uh, coming out of this crisis. I think that after the coronavirus emerged, the approval rate of the government in different countries uh, was listed in some article. I don't remember where it came from, but after the coronavirus came out, the approval rate increased in most countries, except for Japan. In Japan, the approval rating continues to drop. So in that sense, maybe Japan is losing the opportunity in South Korea. Uh, there was a landslide victory in the election as well. So we are, we don't have much time left, but we have received some questions. So let's move on to the Q&A session now. Any questions? Yes, we do have some questions. This is a question to Dr. Mimaki. Cosmopolitanism and communism are combined by, uh, do you think it's relevant to Kant's idea, the cosmopolitanism? What, what do you think about this reference? I guess um, this question is referring to Kant's book. Yes, I think that Kant's um, idea is understood very well, but in the international politics, now Kant is being referred. I hope to see the person who asked the question in the future, but anyway, we need to try to go to the ideal state. And why are we not moving uh, toward the ideal state? We need to be idealistic, but what Kant highlighted is, for example, in the coronavirus crisis, if we give more power to WHO, then WHO would be considered as a expert organization that is supported uh, largely by China, but that's not what we are hoping to see. The ideal is described by the experts, and then how can we implement that in specific measures? That's what we have to think about. The UN was established based on Kant's idea. So the thinking and ideal were combined in a very successful way. So I don't think I answered the question, but that's my response. Yes, so the execution has to be done successfully because the reality is now shifting. So I think it may be even more effective and Studio 202X hashtag is used. Today, unfortunately, we couldn't talk about this, but the global lockdown measures are taken and many people are staying home and people are under stress and domestic violence and child abuse cases are increasing or sexual violence um, cases are also increasing and globally, uh, this phenomenon is happening. So what do you think about this? How can, can, how can we respond to this politically? The international solidarity, um, these are specific cases, so it's very difficult to address, but what's your view? Well, international politics um, is important, but also these things that are happening on an individual basis is also very important. Um, international organizations or multinationals in a crisis like this, uh, they're not going to protect our lives. Uh, we have to once again think about the role of governments and we have to stay home. Um, by staying at home, we will be protecting ourselves, but we are protecting others as well. But if we can't stay home, if your home is not a safe place for you, uh, we are 
ignoring people like that by saying stay home. For people whose homes are not safe, we have to think separately about them. Um, the Prime Minister here in Japan said that, well, he hadn't heard about any DV cases, and that really surprised us. But there were uh, some actions taken after that. So the political leaders, if they say something like that, this civil society will have to react to that and see if the politicians can take action based on what we say. Um, even if you are trying to do your best, that may have been wrong. Maybe what worked in the past doesn't work anymore. Then the civil society has to raise their voices so that you can really change um, what is being done out there. So I think Japan, the citizens' voices, how much can we raise our voices? Um, the approval rating is going down right now, which means that citizens are starting to raise their voices. So how are the politicians going to be able to accept that is the next challenge. Um, another question on Twitter. We are right in the middle of crisis, but I believe we need to think about post-corona. Dr. Shogimen, in relation to this question, uh, this lockdown situation, this is an exceptional situation. We can't continue locking ourselves down forever. I believe lockdown can be done by affluent societies. So at some point in time, we will have to lift uh, this lockdown situation, just like it's happening in Germany. So. When will this end and uh, so and when will lockdown happen again? Um, I believe this is all about control, but after corona and the relaxing of, of this lockdown situation. Well, if I look at New Zealand, the New Zealand government is saying that we don't have to lock down more than necessary. So as early as possible, the lockdown will be relaxed. But from a medical perspective, we shouldn't hurry or else uh, everything that we have done in the past will go to waste. So economic and social normalcy, um, there are requests to go back to that. But also, on the other hand, we have to consider how we control this pandemic. So how do we strike a balance between the two is what's being questioned here. And right now, on a nation state level, uh, the decision is up to the government right now. Well, then post-corona, what will happen? Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister of UK says that maybe we should create a international government, a global government of sorts, uh, to overcome the situation temporarily. Maybe, well, maybe temporarily that is posi possible, but if such a government is created, that may cause a different problem. Uh, the freedom that we want is a freedom to evade a country. Uh, so what happens if this um, international government goes wrong? We have to leave Earth and go out to space. So a world government um, ideal may be very difficult. So you have been studying the history of Europe. Uh, the situation of EU is also changing um, after the Cold War. Um, the EU integration went, uh, went on, but that led to the immigration crisis, and now we have a Brexit and a populist states popping up here and there. So before world government, even Europe um, can't become one. But in a post-corona situation, what will be the role of EU and the European Commission? Well, I haven't studied the EU that much, so it's difficult for me to answer, but I think uh, the system has been damaged greatly. That's my impression. Uh, I talked about uh, Karplani, um, the crustaceous society. 
or crustaceous nation. Uh, one thing is currency. You need to have an integrated currency. And of course, you need to control borders with passports. So these two things are important. So if you are controlling with passports, uh, you are protecting and controlling people coming and going. And right now, we have closed the borders. And we are far away from the ideal situation. And then how will the EU get back on, on its feet after this crisis? It's going to be very tough. Well, Dr. Shogimin, you have talked about uh, the freedom of moving beyond borders. And also that is actually being realized through monitoring these uh, borders and controlling the borders. And I believe we are realizing that. We may have known without really seeing the control, but now we are realizing that is happening. But what will happen to that in the future? Well, as I said earlier, it's not just this issue of the pandemic. We will see a risk rising, especially in relation to environmental issues. We may see a virus that we have never seen before uh, popping up. Um, some people say that. And monitoring the borders and surveillance of the borders may be strengthened. And in exchange for that, uh, we may be able to protect this rather passive freedom of movement. So the freedom of crossing borders um, may need some real rethinking. So before thinking about a world government, um, we have to also think about what we will do with the UN. And another thing may be in the coming year or so, um, global warming, climate change. Uh, the girl Greta and other people have called upon people to act and called for solidarity, but now everything has come to a halt right now. But the coronavirus issue and climate change probably are linked at the very bottom. So uh, everybody wants to close the borders, but because of the many social issues, uh, climate change is one. We need to cooperate between nations, among nations, to um, resolve this issue. So solidarity may become difficult, but the need for solidarity is also growing. So maybe one last for word from each of you about what kind of development uh, post-corona will we see? So uh, Dr. Mimaki first. Well, you raised climate change at the end, and I believe that's very important. Um, and also we have this threat that is risking human lives. Um, in the first half of this year, or in the beginning of this year, we were talking a lot about climate change, but now we don't talk about that much. But now, because of this lockdown, India, uh, in an area where you haven't seen the Himalayas for a very long time, for 30 years, suddenly you see the mountains because the air has become cleaner because of the lockdown. Now, I'm not um, an expert on the pandemic, but I think we have manipulated and changed the ecosystem, and maybe that is why we are creating these pandemics. And we are looking at the pandemics, but the three contagious diseases are still a big problem among developing nations. Uh, we are fighting over face masks, but these countries can't afford to do that. And if the coronavirus spreads to these developing countries, what will happen then? Uh, so this is a great humanitarian threat. And regarding the EU, in Europe and the Central and Eastern Europe, there are 
intentions behind these actions, but China has supported these countries. Of course, there are other motivations behind these uh, actions, but what if China didn't support them, then who would support them? The U.S. would not be able to do that. So the survival instinct of these countries is now revealing. And when we think about solidarity, the solidarity sounds like an empty word in this crisis, but looking at the diplomacy, history of diplomacy for the last 100 years in the U.S., um, some of the things that they did were quite incredible, but then the U.S. was also driving the international community as well. So what kind of society or solidarity can we form in this ecosystem? We need to resolve this issue by looking at other organisms and this ecosystem as well. So we might focus more on bullshit jobs usually, but then we have to focus and our effort on thinking about how to form solidarity. Yes, I think that three guests today were on the same page. That's what we were able to confirm today. So the international solidarity, it's not just about the ideals, but in reality, it's something that we have to achieve. So it's required. But in the, on the other hand, the surveillance is increasing. So we are living in this difficult dilemma and the states have to intervene and citizens have to think about this as well. So if there's anything that you would like to add before we close the session, uh, Doctor, please go ahead. So basically this crisis we are responding to this crisis and unfortunately the nation state is the framework that we are using and by the unit of state nation we are responding to this crisis that is the reality today and in nation states how can these societies uh, respond to what the nation states are doing that is another question and in the end, what we have to think about is, in the crisis, what do we need to defend? What do we need to protect? That is the common good. That's the common good, or public good. In normal times, the freedom and equality of people is something that we have to value. But in the time of crisis, the people's lives need to be protected first. The civil society has this idea they are aligned in this understanding. So this is something that we really see in the society from the late 19th century to early 21st century. The concept of common good has not been talked about because in the world there are desires, and interests, a lot of things are going on. So common good is a difficult concept to grasp. But in the time of crisis, we have to prioritize people's lives. We are aligned in that. And some countries uh, were saying that the Olympics have to be prioritized or economy has to be prioritized. So unfortunately, people's lives may not be the top priority for those countries. But in the case of New Zealand, as I look at New Zealand, it's very clear. So protecting the common good, the patriotism since uh, Cicero, the strict virtues are needed in order to protect the common good. So in the civil society, what is the ultimate value that we have to defend? And what should individual citizens do regardless of what others are doing? How should they exert 
their valid virtues and what virtues do they have to demonstrate? That is what we are asking ourselves. And I think that that's the basis、um, that we need to be aligned in in creating solidarity. Yes, the citizens have to make a decision because their decision、um, determines life or death of others. So, power of citizens or citizenship needs to be established. And in order to achieve that, democracy is, of course, better. And experts with different knowledge and know how should create a community. I think that will be very important going forward. So, thank you very much. We were supposed to end at 8 p.m. Japan time, but we are. Past that scheduled time, and I think that there were many、uh, important points raised in the discussion. And I envy you, Doctor, because you are in New Zealand. That's my honest response and impression.、Um, we hope to continue our discussion further. So I look forward to talking to you again. So, Doctor Shokimen and Doctor Mimaki, thank you very much for joining me today. So, Studio Two Zero Two X, third session, lockdown globalization, now comes to an end. Next week we will have the final session, part four. So once the date and time is fixed, we will be sharing that information on Twitter and Facebook of Gate Institute. So thank you very much for joining us.